Islam is designed to control the lives not only of Muslims, but also of non-Muslims. Terrorism is a tool for controlling your behavior. Endless whining about Islamophobia is a tool for controlling your behavior. Praising people who speak well of Muhammad and heaping abuse on people who speak ill of Muhammad, these are tools for controlling what you say and do. Interestingly, however, the Quran doesn't simply present tools for Muslims to control the behavior of non-Muslims. It also offers a tool for non-Muslims to control the behavior of Muslims, specifically of Muslims who are crossing certain lines with insults and abuse. Oddly enough, Westerners are generally too polite and too politically correct to take advantage of this Quranic trump card, even when it could save lives. Let's read a verse of the Quran, and then we'll look at the historical background to see how important this can be for our time. Surah 6, verse 108, or as I like to call it, Allah's kryptonite. We'll read four translations. Only the first part of the verse is relevant to this discussion. Piktal, revile not those unto whom they pray beside Allah, lest they wrongfully revile Allah through ignorance. Yusuf Ali, revile not ye those whom they call upon besides God, lest they out of spite revile God in their ignorance. Hilali Khan, and insult not those whom they, disbelievers, worship besides Allah, lest they insult Allah wrongfully without knowledge. M. H. Shakir, and do not abuse those whom they call upon besides Allah, lest exceeding the limits they should abuse Allah out of ignorance. On a straightforward reading, this verse commands Muslims not to insult the gods of other people, because insulting the gods of other people could cause those other people to insult Allah. But when we examine the historical context, things get a bit more interesting. From Al-Wahri's Azbab al-Nazul, Revile not those unto whom they pray beside Allah, lest they wrongfully revile Allah through ignorance. 5108, that's a typo, it should be 6108. Said Ibn Abbas, according to the report of Al-Walabi, they, the idolaters, said, O Muhammad, either you stop reviling our idols, or we will revile your Lord. Notice, Muhammad and his followers were already reviling the idols of the polytheists of Mecca. The polytheists were trying to convince the Muslims to stop the insults. And it worked. And so Allah, exalted is he, warned against reviling their idols, lest they wrongfully revile Allah through ignorance. Qatada said, the Muslims used to revile the idols of the unbelievers, and the latter used to react against them. Notice again, the Muslims were insulting the idols of the polytheists. The polytheists were simply reacting. So, which side was initiating the insults? The Muslim side. Muhammad and his companions were the instigators. Eventually, the polytheists got fed up with it and said, if you don't stop insulting our gods and goddesses, we'll insult Allah. And so Allah ordered Muhammad and his followers to stop insulting their gods and goddesses. Allah, exalted is he, therefore, warned the Muslims against being the cause which drives ignorant unbelievers who have no knowledge of Allah to revile Allah as a result of reviling their idols. Don't cause people to insult Allah. Said al-Sudi, when Abu Talib was dying, some chiefs of the Quraysh said, let us go to this man and ask him to forbid his nephew from reviling our idols, for we feel shame to kill him after he passes away and drive the Arabs to say, he used to defend him, but once he passed away, they killed him. And so Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl, al-Nadar ibn al-Harith, Umayyah and Ubay, the sons of Kalaf, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, Amr ibn al-As, al-Aswad ibn al-Bukturi went to see Abu Talib. They said to him, You are our master and chief, but Muhammad has harmed us and harmed our idols. We would like you to call him and warn him against speaking ill of our idols. And from our part, we will leave him alone to his Allah. So, 
the polytheists are practically begging the Muslims to stop with the insults. They're saying, we're fine with you being Muslims. We're fine with you preaching Islam. Just stop insulting our idols and we'll leave you alone. How does Muhammad respond? The Prophet, Allah bless him and give him peace, went when he was summoned. Abu Talib said to him, These are your people and your cousins. The Messenger of Allah, Allah bless him and give him peace, asked them, What do you want? They said, We want you to leave us alone with our idols, and we will leave you alone with your Allah. Abu Talib said, Your people are being fair with you, so give your consent. The Messenger of Allah, Allah bless him and give him peace, said, If I agree to this, would you agree to give me one sentence? If you were to utter it, you would rule over the Arabs and non-Arabs alike? Notice here that even when Muhammad was the persecuted prophet of Mecca, long before any battles had taken place, he was already focused on ruling over the Arabs and the non-Arabs, i.e. everyone. Abu Jahl said, Yes, by your father, we will give it to you and also give you ten other things like it. But what is it? He said, Say, there is no God but Allah. Now, did you catch that? Muhammad, we want you to stop insulting our idols and we won't bother you. Muhammad replies, Okay, I'll stop insulting your idols, but only if you say, there is no God but Allah. In other words, only if you become Muslims. They refused and expressed their aversion at this proposal, upon which Abu Talib said, Son of my brother, ask for something else, for your people are wary of this. He said, O oh, uncle, I am not one who would ask for other than that. If they were to place the sun in my hand, I would not ask for anything other than that. So Muhammad says, I'll only stop insulting their idols if they accept Islam. Abu Talib says, Ask for something else, and Muhammad replies, there's nothing else I'll accept from them. But watch what happens. The chiefs of Quraysh said, You would better stop reviling our idols, or we will revile you and revile he who commands you. And so Allah, exalted as he, revealed this verse. So, the pagans wanted to negotiate. Muhammad said, even if you gave me the sun and put it in my hands, I wouldn't stop insulting your gods and goddesses. The only thing that will make me stop is you converting to Islam. But the pagans finally figured out Allah's kryptonite. They said, if you don't stop insulting our idols, we're going to insult you and Allah. They didn't want to insult Allah, but they decided that they would insult Allah if Muhammad didn't stop insulting their idols. And what was Allah's response? And do not abuse those whom they call upon besides Allah, lest exceeding the limits they should abuse Allah out of ignorance. Allah ordered Muhammad and his followers to stop insulting the idols of the pagans. Allah can't handle mockery. If a Muslim is doing something that's going to cause people to insult Allah, the Muslim is supposed to stop. Now, this only applies to non-essential behaviors. You can't say to a Muslim, stop praying or I'll insult Allah. Prayer is an essential part of Islam. But insulting unbelievers and their idols isn't essential. And so Allah says, if your insults are going to cause people to insult me, stop insulting. How is this relevant to us? Well, if a Muslim crosses a line with insults and abuse, you can actually implement Surah 6 verse 108 of the Quran and order him to stop. You can say, look, if you don't stop with these insults, I'm going to insult your God and your prophet and your book. This doesn't mean that the Muslim will stop. It only means that, according to the Quran, he's supposed to stop. A Muslim isn't supposed to be the cause of people insulting Allah. As an example, Muhammad Hijab recently started insulting the wives of critics of Islam. He's been targeting women with mockery and abuse. He's even been using imagery of torture and rape when insulting women and suggesting that deep down, some of them actually want to be subjugated and raped by Muslim conquerors. More recently, he's been trying to convince Hindus to target the wives 
of ex-Muslims. His followers have been cheering him on. Of course, if I were to say anything remotely comparable to what Muhammad Hijab has been saying, I would be rebuked off the internet by my fellow Christians. But abusing and degrading women is much more respectable in the religion that gave you British rape gangs. So, Hijab has started a campaign of harassment and abuse directed towards women. And it's actually become pretty common for Muslims to react to criticism of Muhammad by insulting the critics' family members. Watch what happens when Hatun Tash criticizes Muhammad. You are not representing Christianity. No, your mom is rubbish. Your mom is rubbish. Your mom is rubbish. Yeah. Your mom, your mom is rubbish. No, your mom, your mom and dad did. That's how you was born. Your mom had sex with a child. That's how you were born. Yeah, your mom had sex with a child. Yeah. That's why you're dirty. Yeah, your mom is an evil, filthy. Your mom is a prostitute. How about that? Your mom is a prostitute. Yeah, that's your mom. No, no, no. That's what she's saying. No, that's your mom is a prostitute. Your mom is a prostitute. Your mom is the biggest prostitute. That's why you're a son of a bitch. Your mom's a whore. Yeah, your mom's a spiegel. They put you here, they banged your mom for free, so they put you here to make division between Christians and Muslims. You're a devil. You're a devil like you. Yeah, because she's a whore. Because she's a whore. She's a whore. That's why. Yeah, she's a whore. Yeah, you know, because your mom was a whore. She had, like, it was like that, innit? That's why you came out quickly. It's like that. Yeah, that's your mom. Yeah, that's your mom. Now, it's one thing when a random Muslim starts insulting family members. It's something completely different when a man who has a ton of followers starts encouraging his followers to target women with abuse. When a popular apologist for an ideology that promotes wife-beating, female genital mutilation, prostitution, honor killings, child molestation, and sex slavery openly declares that he's calling on his fans to escalate their abuse of women, should you A, make him stop, or B, not make him stop. If a man has a violent and abusive personality, and this violent and abusive personality is encouraged and amplified by his ideology, and he announces that he's starting a campaign of abuse against women, and you know there's something you can do to make him stop, should you do it? I would say yes. So, is there something you can do to make people like Hijab Stop insulting and harassing women. Absolutely. The Quran says that if Muhammad Hijab's insults and abuse are going to cause people to insult Allah, he's supposed to stop. So all you would need to do is insult Allah and the Quran until Muhammad Hijab finally decides to obey the Quran. But Westerners, especially Christians, have become so obsessed with not offending people, and with not hurting people's feelings, and with not insulting others, that they wouldn't dream of implementing Surah 6, verse 108. They wouldn't dream of saying, Hey, you stop this, or I'm going to insult your God and your book. They won't insult someone's God or prophet or book, even if it's to protect women from a campaign of harassment and abuse, and even if the religion in question basically holds up a sign and says, hey, if you want us to stop doing something, just insult our God, our prophet, and our book, and we'll stop. And for the life of me, I can't understand this. I understand not wanting to be a jerk, and not wanting to needlessly offend people. I understand that sort of thing. I don't understand being so opposed to causing offense that you won't even stand up for your wives and for women in general when someone announces that he's putting together an online army to harass and abuse and bully women. That I don't get. If you tell me you're starting a campaign of abuse targeting women and I know there's a non-violent way to make you stop, I'm going to make you stop, even if it's something that will hurt your feelings. If your religion offers me a way to make you stop, I'm going to use it against you, even if you find it offensive. So, in the coming weeks, as I explore different ways of insulting the Quran, some of you won't understand why I'm doing it. And you're going to send me messages saying, David, why are you stooping to this level? But before you ask me, David, why are you stooping to this level? Let me ask you in advance. What level do you think I'm stooping to? 
the level of defending women from abusive men, that's not a level I'm stooping to. That's a level I'm never going to retreat from. And if I have to mutilate a thousand lifeless Qurans in order to protect women from a Muslim apologist's threats of rape and torture, get ready to see what a creative genius I am.